Hello and welcome to True Crime Diary, a light-hearted podcast on a serious subject. Every two weeks we look back through true crime stories to discuss an event that took place on this week in history. I'm your host Mark Decano and with me as always are my friends Jed Lester. Hello. And Rue Turner. Hello. So we've had Hi. an email from, you'll have to forgive me, it's Stasia or Stacia? I'm going to say Stacia. Stakia. Stakia. <laughs> a listener. I'm going to say Stacia. A listener. <laughs> yes. A dear listener. A dear listener. It's a bit, no, I feel a bit, I feel an idiot, not that we don't know how to pronounce a name, but anyway, we we enjoy... It's a beautifully exotic name. Yeah. That's yes, why exactly. We can't yeah, pronounce yeah. it. And it's succinct. Good and to know. This, <laughs> no, this listener, this listener was good enough to recommend our podcast and post on our Facebook page, um, but also emailed us to say, I really enjoy your podcast, and I was hoping that perhaps you might do a show on the unsolved Hinterkaifeck murders. How do you feel about that, then? Uh, well, yeah, I'm. Uh, you've looked into it, haven't you? And it looks Big pretty. Fan. It looks pretty <laughs> good. <Fan. laughs> it looks good, but we're, the only thing is that we're. Be- I mean, we're not beholden to anything really. But the if hmm. we take our the name of our podcast uh, literally, we've got to wait until the calendar dictates when we can. Yeah. Do it. Is there only literally one date that we can? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it occurred in uh, in March, and obviously okay. we've our March and April episodes are pretty much set. Yeah, fine, and that's be, right. And we'll because they are, as she rightly says, unsolved, there are no later dates that we could look at. Uh, I mean, you know, let's face it. Let's hopefully we'll do it ne- next time round. But the uh, I like an unsolved case because we could just try and solve yeah. it. <laughs> it's a good one. It is interesting. Yeah. So. Is it, yeah, I mean, listeners in the meantime can look into it themselves and then see if we do it justice if they Give remember us. Give us a uh, vague, a quick one-liner of what it's about. Uh, well, to put it bluntly, um, there's some murders in the ni- in uh, 1922. Yep. There's a, a little farm in Bavaria, which is near Munich in Germany. So have we just missed the 100th anniversary? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, damn it, Stacia. You should have emailed. <laughs> Why did you email us a, a month ago? ago yeah. You've literally ruined. Why? Oh, oh God. Um, <laughs> basically, um, six members of the family and the staff were all found struck dead. They were stacked up in the barn, and it is the centenary. But no, it, we'll do it on the hundred and first anniversary. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully, right. but we can stay in Germany for today's episode. Yes. So the date we're looking at this episode is the 25th of April, and in 1983, West Germany's Stern magazine announced at a press conference that they had acquired Hitler's personal diaries, which apparently had crashed on a plane in East Germany in 1945, and they had been in negotiation for two years, spending millions of marks, and would shortly be published. Unfortunately, every single one of the 60 volumes was a forgery. Did they... Uh, uh, it was published then, was it? Because um, you were saying they were in negotiations for years, but... They were in negotiation for years for to get the diaries. Yep. Uh, the number of diaries kept growing. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, as they fair, became more that, valuable. To be fair, the, uh, if you leave it... If, you, if it took them two years, yeah. then there's more volumes coming along as, as the day goes by. Yeah. <laughs> Each time you buy one, got another one, another one comes out. 60 is quite a lot, though, isn't it? That's a lot. 60 that's volumes. That's quite greedy. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. If you're going to fake Hitler's diaries, you'd probably just do a couple, wouldn't you, maybe? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I mean, they didn't quite make it to publication. There was a lot of, oh, okay. so they did. of hoo-ha sure. about them being published. So there was a press conference, there was a big announcement. Stern magazine did a, a full front page basically saying about, you know, Hitler stories discovered. In, they the, had, in the news, yeah. just news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before it went to publication, they'd already made agreements for uh, serialisation rights to France, to yeah. Newsweek, and the Sunday Times. In oh, England, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And all of whom were saying, oh, you know, we're gonna, we've got this huge, amazing of course, scoop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then um, within two weeks of the announcement, the final announcement confirming that they were genuine, it was proved that they were all fake. Right, right, right. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> so, how are we going to talk about how they were all drawn in? Yes, for sure. So, I, mean, I suppose technically they all ultimately the truth 
was out there, but it, it, eventually. <laughs> but, the truth is that, well, you fuck smolder. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, but for, a, well, for two years, they fully were... They believed. completely believed it, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, more, more than just the people around the table, it wasn't just the newspapermen who believed it. Collectors believed it, and um, historians believed it. They said, yeah, this is definitely real. They oh, even wow. compared the handwriting in them two samples of Hitler's handwriting. Well, as you would, you would though, wouldn't had. you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> the glorious part about that is <laughs> that the uh, the letters that they compared them to for authentication were themselves forgeries made uh, by the same man. <laughs> well, these fit. This is a fake. Right, OK. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. prolific, if nothing else. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. planned it all out, I suppose. Yeah, we need to talk about this man for sure. So his name's Conrad Kujau. Um, he was basically a petty criminal. He was a, a thief and a forger. He, he would forge like luncheon vouchers and things. But <laughs> he was literally a very petty criminal. Right. I mean, I must admit, I think the only thing I, in the iota of respect that I have, <laughs> is the respect of. He thought, actually, do you know what? I'm gonna this this subject matter, this person. I'm gonna go for it and say that I've. You know, and that is gig- and I'm giving a mild pat on the back yeah, yeah. for going actually I tell you what I've got an idea I'm going to do this and I'm going to sell it whatever all around the world and alright fine he, he was you know they yeah. found out but the it, it, uh, I'm giving vague kudos <laughs> for giving it a go what a cool lie you are oh he, yeah he'd yeah. been faking and selling like World War 2 memorabilia and Nazi memorabilia right. for years why didn't yeah. they Oh, it's him. Oh, forget it then. Well, no, because this is this is the glorious part of post-war Germany. So you've got East Germany and West Germany. You have to remember this is pre-reunification. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in about 1970, I think it was, remembering that in the DDR, East Germany, yep. trade in Nazi memorabilia was illegal, but in, in the East West Germany, Germany right. it was not. Okay. So no, so he hit on a scheme whereby he could buy black market memorabilia in East Germany and then sell it in was West it real? Germany. Real, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, but common and not very yeah, expensive. Sure, sure. But yeah, nonetheless, yeah. it was black market, so you could buy it cheaply and then sell it to sure, collectors. Yeah, yeah. So as long as you can go through the... You uh, just smuggle it out, yeah. Yeah, gate. I mean, that in itself wasn't that easy, but... Sure, OK. Yes, sir, I'm a regular Sears and Roebuck. So he was living in uh, Stuttgart in West Germany. Mm-hmm. So he would go across to East Germany, visit people, whoever, buy cheap like mm-hmm. helmets and medals Uniform. and things, yeah. and then come back. And by 1974, he had a shop. And the, the key, what he learned was that he could not only buy these things and cheaply and then sell them at a profit to collectors in West Germany, but if he was to come up with some way of making them seem like they were more important, yeah, <laughs> more authentic, yeah, then like some sort of authentication. It's like it's all one good one thing to have a, a German army helmet from the First World War, for example. But if you've got a letter of some kind saying that that was worn at Eep by Adolf Hitler as a young man, yeah, sure, sure. That's I mean, much that example, more... <laughs> I mean, that ex- particular example, yes, I would agree. Yeah. So he thought, ah, oh, why don't I just forge loads of documents? And yeah, stuff? okay. So you don't have to forge the item, you just forge the provenance. Just forge the provenance, exactly. Tell you who was into uh, that kind of collecting all of that stuff that he would have uh, sold? Mm-hmm. Lemmy. Yeah, definitely. He was, I don't know why, but he was massively, massively into collecting. Not the... Well, as far as I'm aware, not the politics behind it, but just the memorabilia of Second World War Germany things. Yeah. And he was a massive, massive collector of it for some reason. Don't know why. Do you know why? He just liked it. Yeah. Uh, it's... I don't think it was anything to do with his viewpoint or anything. He just liked it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you've got this idea whereby um, World War II Germany had this kind of... You know, like, their uniforms are designed by Hugo Boss and something. It's yes. very stylistic. Sure, yeah, yeah. So there's that. I think that's why he likes it. It's short-lived, it's rare, it's militaristic, you know. Is it cool? Is it cool? <laughs> My cool. Do I look cool? Do I really look cool? Do I? Do I? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> um... But it's, I mean, you I know, don't, it just seems a bit weird if we try and suggest it's cool. But, you know, it's but black it's, leather and right, it's leather right, jackets okay, and yeah, all that yeah. sort of thing. It's very... It's metal. It's, 
It's, me- yeah. it's metal. It's very heavy, very metal. Meaning, yes. Yeah. Right, okay. Right. It's by yeah. bi- so bi- eagles and leather. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's metal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, well, anyway, yeah, he was into that. He was into all that, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, so Kujau was doing well selling his uh, stuff out of his shop in the 70s. Mm. He was forging everything. So he didn't have letters just from Hitler. He had from, from Bormann, from Hess, from Goering. <laughs> from, he had from, from everybody. So um, the, the memorabilia was fine. It was, he was just putting cherries on the top. Yeah, well, at, yeah, at, if, at first. So if he started out by buying things, then yes. he'd fake authentication for them, uh, give them, sort of make them more valuable. Yeah. But then, why not just, like, fake the why things? Why not bother buying the so thing in the first place? He wrote uh, war poetry of and yeah, yeah, yeah. did paintings that were alleged to be by Adolf Hitler. Right, right. Even though they were terrible. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I, I, I think they're excellent finger paintings. I mean, you know, the Austrian artist that yeah. was formerly. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's less. Known as he's less. Basically, group. yeah, yeah. The uh, his lesser known artistic work, but you could, in that particular instance, you could quite easily compare, couldn't you? The uh, oh, here's a new doodle. <laughs> the new doodle. But you can comp- compare it, couldn't you? Yeah, you can, but I mean, artists' styles change, and if you flood the market, people end up comparing yours to other ones of yours, like they did yeah, with his letters. Exactly. And... Right, right. But I mean, they didn't like just paint a whole series of landscapes. He painted just random things. Oh, did yeah. he? Oh, so sorry, one would right. be of like a nude male model, and one something else would be of a still life, and something else. There'd be. He didn't like. It's not like he had a, a, a theme. A, a, prefer- a theme, yeah. Right. Obviously, I don't know. What. And not just Hitler's paintings either. He painted Modigliani's and Paul Klee and all sorts of people. There's one of his Modigliani's yeah. hanging in Vienna in the museum in Vienna right now. What do you mean his for? <laughs> yeah, his forgery. The forgery. Yeah, right. Although, Why to be fair, there are more Modigliani forgeries out there than there are <laughs> real ones. Right. But but his is his one is known and it's hanging in the museum of for, of forgeries in Vienna. The Museum of Forgeries? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, that's why. <laughs> Hang on a minute. This is real. <laughs> Get that out of here. <laughs> Burn it. This forgery is a fake. What did... It's so real. Did... Um, this yeah, this forgery. forgery is fake. It's real. Uh-huh. And are there any other paintings in the museum with bad spirits in them? Did Hitler have a theme of art? Meaning, did the... Landscapes, for- mostly. Yeah. Right, okay. He I was going to say, did the forger at Vienna, didn't he? Mm. River escapes and things. Right. Okay. So he could have again if he had the. I don't know. Perhaps he was. If he's gone to he, Vienna. He could have. Yeah. Exactly. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Gone yeah. around the corner of it and done a bit, few more views. Yeah. But he just painted he just painted, a, painted a bowl view. of bananas or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do they have bananas? And we haven't seen a banana, <laughs> <laughs> let alone a bowl. How do you draw a banana without ever having seen exactly, one? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Hang on, they're red and square. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a banana. One of the things, though, one of the remarkable things about this whole situation is that Kujo was not very good at forgeries. At painting? Was he good at uh, painting? Well, no, I mean, but he passed that off as, you know... Hitler wasn't good at painting. <laughs> right, right, right. But the thing is, also, he had poor spelling, and his grammar wasn't very good. Really? <laughs> Even in German, but, but again, particularly I, I in still, English. I still give him kudos for going, actually, do you know what? I'm yeah. not actually good at painting, and I've got, what do you say? I've got poor, poor grammar spelling, and poor spelling. Grammar. Do you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fake <laughs> letters by different people who are weirdly going to have the same spelling errors as the things I would write. Yeah, yeah. And each other. I am too smart. I am too smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-R-T. And t- in order to age this, I mean, he had this paper, he was using modern paper, and he just, to age it, he just poured... <laughs> Please don't tell me he dipped them in tea. He just poured tea over it, yeah. <laughs> tea? Tea. Tea's a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. Classic. Sepia. Classic. It's your absolute classic. Yeah, yeah, Schoolboy. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the diaries, he poured tea on them and then just banged them against the desk to make them beaten up and look, yeah, yeah, yeah. look worn. These diaries, I mean, they're great and stuff, but they smell of tea. <laughs> um, Surprisingly sweet-smelling paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What other way could he have made it brown? <laughs> Do you have to or make it could have it used brown? old paper. Yeah, yeah. Instead of sure, just gone yeah. to the stationery shop on the corner and buy modern That's paper. The old paper from the 40s. He bought cheap notebooks in East Germany and just used them. Which right. arguably East German notebooks would have been older than West German notebooks, but not by right. Yeah, I see. What you mean. There probably would have been some 
German military notebooks in the marketplace somewhere. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't go that far. No. no. They might have cost him. I can't, I can't believe it took two years for them to... I oh, know, for the, that was, they were in negotiation for two yes. years. So experts were massively drawn in, not just yeah. for a quick chat, but ongoing for two years. Because in their eyes, what, what they... I'm assuming what they saw of a gigantic scoop was clouding their... Yeah, absolutely, hundred uh, percent thoughts. You know, about. didn't fall for it though, don't you? Oh yeah, Holocaust denier and Nazi sympathizer oh. David Irving. Yes. Yeah. So he he did he, he did said, no, he oh, said right, they were right, fake. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. He said they don't match up with historical events. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, in fairness, the most of the text was just lifted verbatim from Mein Kampf or like history <laughs> right, books. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. And then the other stages. So he, I suppose technically he'd know, wouldn't and he? And he'd throw in other bland sentiments like sure, here and there yeah. um, uh, supposedly one of them was um, something about his dog wasn't well Blondie April 18th I ate nothing while Ava enjoyed her vegetable hot pot <laughs> and well, the, one of my favourite ones is uh, uh, Ava says I have bad breath <laughs> oh, God <laughs> yeah. I mean it's quite and it's just sort of right that is and a then be a, thing. a long rant about something or other <laughs> Right, but also um, Kujal, he, uh, he put his own spin on it as well because he would, some of it would basically allude to the idea that Hitler was not aware of what was happening to the Jews at the time. Yeah, right, um, so, so meaning what? That was his yeah. political angle. In yeah, his personal a little slant of propaganda yeah, that he worked kind of into soft edge well. to the whole Holocaust thing a bit. Didn't yeah, it? yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Which is surprising, David Erden didn't love that. Yeah, yeah sure. Because yeah, he yeah, was yeah. very much a revisionist well, of course and trying to yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. you know... Of trying to, to deny it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, both his parents were in the Nazi party, and um, right. he grew up sort of basically believing what he was told. Sure, um, yeah, yeah. He was born in just before the war, so he basically, as a youth growing up, all he knew was what his parents and what were the news and everything course, around him yeah, was, yeah. was pro-Nazi, so... He kind of softened it a little bit, yeah. But anyway, regardless, the well, the four papers or magazines that you mentioned, yes, were more than happy to have some a piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. This message must be read in every newspaper, heard on every radio, seen on every television. And it all really is everything that have happened was pretty much because of one man named Gerd Heidemann. He worked for Stern magazine. He was an obsessive um, investigative journalist. Um, he was known as the Bloodhound mm -hmm. um, for being a, a keen investigator. In fact, he was so keen on investigating that he rarely bothered to stop and actually write down <laughs> his stories. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, they just they just pile the office with loads and loads and loads of notes and yes. reference material, and then other colleagues would have to actually write. <laughs> the story from all of his notes because he just kept investigating. Right. <laughs> just loved the chase, but not actually yeah. the final hunt. Do you mind writing this down? No, oh, no, no. I'm too, too busy investigating. I've got to meet a guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The problem with Heidemann was that he was effectively, well, he was Nazi obsessed. And you've got to remember also that this is the time, as I say, he was doing a roaring, Kujau was doing a roaring yeah. trade in memorabilia in his West German store because sure. there was a lot of. I wouldn't say sentimentality, but certainly interest in the yeah. war. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so hang on. Go, uh, so he had... Was his shop in Stuttgart, where yeah, he lived? Yeah. So his shop solely sold... Nazi uh, memorabilia yeah, <laughs> that he bought from East Germany. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> At one point, he even stood as mayor for Stuttgart. I mean, that... But that's <laughs> surely... A, one votes. That, oh, wow. right, OK. Uh, that's just a continuation of his... Uh, lust for attention. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, I think a product of his own mind or something. There were the, yeah, but there was a lot of obsession with Nazism, Nazism, in West Germany at the time. It's just a fascination, a historical fascination. Not the belief of, but just the not so much reviewing the no. No, but, but also do remember Matter. that a lot of former SS and Nazi party <laughs> members were in political office or sure, just yeah, yeah, wandering yeah. around. Yeah, right, right, you know, right. After the denazification. Yeah. A massive regime doesn't just disappear into air. You know? Yeah, exactly. A lot of them did, but yeah, yeah. 
a lot of, well, a lot South of them, America. A, yeah, a lot of them went to South America. But I mean, also, but there were Austrian and German politicians and business owners and who were high-ranking Nazi officials during the war who still stayed in positions of relative power after the war. Right, right, right. Bloody hell. I think the president of Austria was a former SS officer, I believe, at one point. Really? Probably, I believe that's true. Mm. Heidemann himself was a former Hitler Youth member. Yes. Mm. Well, right. Yeah. But Hitler Youth, like in its early days, was pretty much just like the Boy Scouts. Uh, well, you say that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't forget there was a... a I know Baden Powell was influenced by them a little bit, but it wasn't sort of like pack, pack, pack. heavy on the Nazi <laughs> side, was it? <laughs> Uh, well, yes. I mean, it was milit- militaristic, and don't forget that Hitler Youth had political, ideological undertones. Although they were mostly running around doing fitness stuff, but that's so that it would be strong and healthy for the mm-hmm. inevitable armed forces service yeah, that we'd be right. cajoled so it's into. More of a, it's a boot camp for kids. Yeah, bottom yeah. level recruitment process. Yeah, and I would doubt that Baden Powell was shouting at the Boy Scouts that they they would be big and strong and fight and die for their no. Fuhrer and country. No. <laughs> Probably not. No. Various knots. <laughs> yeah, they'd learn how to do a bowline. Yeah. Two half hitches. <laughs> <laughs> and how to light a gas camping stove. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Early. Now, Heidemann was uh, so obsessed that in 1973, um, he went to take pictures for the for Stern magazine of the Karin II, which is Hermann Goering's yacht, which was a bit knackered at the time. But he- he- Heidemann was so obsessed with it that he took out a mortgage so that he could buy the yacht for himself. Wow. Blimey. No money in yacht. What does he want a yacht for? But he researched and mm-hmm. met and interviewed Edda Goering, Goering's daughter. Yep. And uh, they had a fling. Oh, yeah. So obsessed, he had a fling with a Nazi's daughter. Right, right. Yeah. But this meant that now he had access to a whole bunch of important, as, yeah, as of far course, as he yeah, saw yeah. them, important people. So it, it wouldn't be unusual for him to have parties on the yacht with former SS generals like um, Wilhelm Monk would be a guest on the yacht. Um, and Monk was also a guest at Heidemann's wedding in 1979. And they went on a honeymoon to South America where they enjoyed uh, the company of Walter Ralph and Klaus Barbie at their honeymoon. <laughs> Both wanted for war crimes. Yeah. Nazis. I hate these guys. For reference, uh, Willem Monk, he was a general. He worked with in Berlin as an SS officer. Walter Ralph was an aide of Reinhard Heydrich. And after the war, he worked for West German intelligence. And Klaus Barbie um, was known as the Butcher of Lyon. He um, he uh, worked in France, occupied France, and personally tortured lots of people, including Jews and French resistance. And then he later, in South America, advised the Bolivian government on how to torture its citizens. <laughs> Not a nice uh, piece no. of work. Did he just say, come on, Barbie, let's go party? Yay! <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, unfortunately, because he was mortgaged and he had this yacht, he was running out of money quickly, and he tried to sell it, yeah. asking for 1.1 million Deutschmarks, but didn't get any offers. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, Strangely enough. Yeah. So he asked his former SS Nazi mates what he could do, and one of them, um, a collector, put him in touch with a man named Fritz Stiefel, who was a collector, and Stiefel was a regular purchaser from Kujau. So by the time he got to the late 70s, when Stiefel borrowed a diary from Kujo, he wanted to buy it, but word quickly got round, and Heidemann was told by one of his contacts that Stiefel had a diary. And that basically, <laughs> once Heidemann and Stiefel got together, <laughs> it was... <laughs> it was Moida. <laughs> that is Fritz Stiefel. He's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> so was it a... Do we know if it was a plan that was hatched by both of them, or was it solely... Uh, no, Heidemann was convinced f- from the outset. Uh, I mean, because, you know... He was just... Right, sorry. He just yeah. wanted all the stuff. He, he basically got... It's, it wasn't a scoop, but in his eyes... In his eyes, it was a got completely... Scoop, yeah. Right, yeah, fine, yeah. I guess once you meet Ku Jiao, and you kind of see that the world that he exists in and Mm. the amount of stuff that is around him and in his collection and passing through him it suddenly becomes more likely 
Well, also, this is the diary of Hitler. Well, also, he's talking to the essentially the best person in the world to try and sell his yeah. con, yeah. 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 who effectively wants, I would imagine, wants to believe and that, his yeah, scoop. I, yeah. I think that's kind of the, the biggest like seed in this whole thing is so many people want this to be true yeah, yeah. Or, or what is it so many people or is it just this one well bloke? yeah no it's not i mean no, a lot a lot of a lot of people and i think they this do. is why right. okay. this is why these things were initially authenticated because like that first diary was seen by a, a couple of people like sure. collectors and that and yeah, they yeah. both said oh yeah definitely for sure this is absolutely true but then they're collectors they would they want that to be true yeah that's what i'm saying yeah. but he but the fact that that Heidemann is uh, well collected stuff and wanted to be mates with and was with yeah. SS people and bought a boat and was just absolutely up for yeah. anything to do with and his from Heidelman's love point of view. If anyone is going to have hit access to Hitler's diaries, yeah, it's Kuja. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's then so he's it, but that meeting is the reason why we're now talking yeah. about it yeah. today because if he'd met do you reckon if it's fair to say if he'd met I don't know someone who wasn't as um, driven mm. as Heidemann it wouldn't have come to light or it just would have fizzled out or I don't know but the reason why it, the kind of snowball started to get bigger yeah it fell down the mountain was because of Heidemann going, oh my oh, God. Not for actually sure. investigating enough. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is it. This is a man who, as you say, he just investigates, investigates, investigates. But all he's done, basically, is he's wandered around Kujau's shop, uh, shop yeah, and yeah. what have you, and just beguiled by yeah, exactly. everything. And as an investigator, he's saying, well, look, he's got all this stuff. Therefore. And, yeah, and Kujau is saying, I've got, because obviously he's got contacts contacts that he claims to have in east germany yep. you know who have to keep their identity secret so mm -hmm. he's got no his articles don't yeah. have any provenance other than that he's provided because sure, nobody yeah. knows who yeah, these yeah. people who are you know high-ranking yeah. ddr officers or former SSC. and no one can go and ask anybody because it would be illegal for them to be providing it in the first yeah, place exactly so it's a perfect it is <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah it literally is it's perfect a literal, storm, literal iron curtain of light yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So in, in January 1981, Kujau, uh, his phone number is given to Heidemann and Heidemann rings him up to try and open up negotiation on this diary and what mm. other articles he might have. And <laughs> Kujau claims he's got 27 volumes of diaries. Yeah, okay. Very minor Calm down. This, to start with. Yeah, At yeah. this point, only one diary um, he's aware of. Kujau now tells him that there are 27 diaries. He says there is a third volume of Mein Kampf. Right, OK. Yeah. <laughs> He says also that he has... Um, I really would want to know what the sequel would be called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. still struggling. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lots of other bits and pieces, but the, the, the cherry on the top is he claims he has an opera written by a young Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Called uh, Wieland der Schmied, which means Wieland the blacksmith. I mean, it's got to have like, the Valkyries in it as well. Oh, yeah, well, he was Wagner obsessed, was he? So it's going to be, yeah, absolutely Wagnerian. Wagnerian, yeah, it's insane. But if he's as good at op opera and scoring as he yeah. is at painting and writing and everything and diarising, it's probably not going to be very good. <laughs> and Heidemann would just would have been brilliant. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, well, he would have been absolutely beside himself. Yeah. Yeah. They set up. Bring a, it on. They set up a meeting, and Heidemann was there for seven hours hmm. negotiating with Kujau. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's just seven hours of drinking beer, isn't it? Really, yeah. and schnapps and uh, <laughs> knockwurst. Yeah. And Part of this negotiation was that Heidemann offered two million marks for the entire collection, and Kujau responded that, um, "Well, that's fine, but I need absolute secrecy, and of course." Most of it's still in East Germany, so I'll need lots of time to write it. Write it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Right, right. 
Okay. Anyone for tea? Yeah, well, exactly. There was a sort of a little thing which showed where Heinemann's mind was also coming from, because not only was he absolutely obsessed by Nazi mm. memorabilia, but he was also looking very much out for himself. So he agreed a 200,000 mark deposit with his employers, but he only offered half of that to Kuja. <laughs> Oh, is he so he'd already yeah. pocketed 100,000 marks for himself. The I'm trying to think what how much a mark, a mark was. So two million marks, that would have been about a million dollars, which would have been pounds would have been about half a million, roughly. Maybe a little more. <laughs> so it's a lot of money, isn't it? Back yeah. then? Plenty. But if that's real, they would have seen it as cheap, probably, wouldn't they? Just pay. Cons- well, yeah, yeah. Considering once you serialise it and they string it out over the next twenty years, really, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, totally, yeah. it'll be a long-term sale. Sure, yeah. Here's us and doing all the planning for the <laughs> fake, <laughs> the fake deal, and historians and people would be documentaries forever. <laughs> I mean, there'd be still papers being written now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the other conditions of the deal was that Kujau would only deal with Heinemann, which suited him down to the ground. <laughs> so yeah, it meant yeah. that, obviously, he could, as the go-between, he could extract his the commission. The people involved in uh, a fraud, okay. the tighter the fraud yeah, can right, be kept. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, effectively, a, a bunch of <laughs> meetings over the next couple of months is just Kujau creating more wares to mm. share. Um, and, as I say, he literally just copied things directly. Um, he just went and wrote a load of new stuff. He just wrote a load of stuff. He cool. he claimed that um, he was working on a schedule of three diaries a month. <laughs> right, OK. Yeah. Um, he said he did one in three hours. <laughs> and another day he did three diaries in three days. Right, OK. Yeah. So it's just basically prolific work. But again... Knocking him out. Yeah. But he said he copied a load of stuff from, like, newspapers and magazines. And uh, there's a book by uh, Max Domerus called Hitler's Speeches and Proclamations, 1932 to 1945, which he basically copied word for word. <laughs> oh, OK. Right. For God's sake. Yeah, yeah. And then he just littered it with, as I say, like tr- day-to-day pieces. trivia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Dog's not well again. Dog's not well again. Yeah, yeah. Done a bit of art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be classic. Describe the day that you painted the painting that he's forged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh. yeah. yeah. Genius. Ah, oh, that bowl of bananas. Brilliant. <laughs> so after a couple of months, they had paid 680,000 Deutschmarks for the diaries. Wow. Um, Kujau had received possibly half this. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. And there wasn't a single contract or agreement in place for any of it. Correct. It was wow, all wow. basically done on yeah. the word of Kujau and Heidemann. Wow, wow. Because <laughs> you can't have a contract with an anonymous source. Oh, uh, Okay. Yeah, and of course Heidemann got ten percent commission as well. <laughs> so he was getting most of it. He was getting most of yeah, the money. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's one for you, one for me, two for you, one, two for me, three for you, one, two, three for me, four for you, one, two, three, four for me. Wait a minute, how are you counting? Newsweek was given extracts from the diaries as a taster to get them to serialise it. Yes, of course. They yeah. eventually pulled out, but not before they decided that they would publish what they had been shown anyway because they couldn't come to an agreement so they said well what we've been shown we're going to publish anyway which kind of put everyone on the back foot did they not have an NDA then you'd think you'd have a non-disclosure agreement so that that we're going to show you this stuff but you can't publish it I don't think anything about this was done properly in any way shape (laughs) or form sure Um, so some of the things that uh, Newsweek published were quotes like he said uh, Himmler's in another world he's in a Germanic fantasy world I think he's out of his mind (laughs) God (laughs) He said, the English are driving me crazy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> how is Churchill reacting? And uh, <laughs> how on earth does Stalin manage it? I always imagined he had no officers left, but he did the right thing. He's talking about the purges. <laughs> A new command structure in the Wehrmacht is what we need to. Right. This is all just completely made up, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Newsweek published those. Wow, wow, wow. wow. And it, Newsweek, in, in publishing, they basically they put uh, the Sunday Times on the back foot because they had the serialisation rights which they agreed yeah so then they broke their embargo by saying that they they had the serialisation rights they basically they were going to go to press and then that put Stern on the back foot as well so everyone started suddenly getting excited about Mm -hmm. this and that's when egging each other on yeah and, and that's when the historians like Hugh Trevor Roper who declared initially that the diaries were authentic started to second guess and say actually I don't think they are and that's when the House of Cards began to collapse. Right, OK. 
by this time, though, there were 60 diaries that were in the frame. <laughs> um, that's, getting, that's gone up from that one they had. Yes, and they were getting thicker and more expensive because he was writing more and more in them. Oh, yeah. Surely they weren't buying them by the pound. <laughs> <laughs> um, they had traded in 300 forged oil paintings. Wow. 300. <laughs> Supposedly the gun that Hitler used to commit suicide. <laughs> God. The flag that uh, they carried during the beer hall putsch. All of this was all fake and all traded for hundreds of thousands of Deutschmarks. Wow. So after two years of negotiations and hundreds of thousands of marks changing hands, as well as lots of artefacts and diaries, as I said, in 1983, Stern declared the existence of the diaries and the publication that was coming. And as the presses began to roll at the Sunday Times, Rupert Murdoch was told that his historian, Hugh Trevor Roper, had basically done a U-turn and wasn't uh, willing to declare the authenticity of the diaries anymore. He didn't think they were real now. And Baron Dacre, who was editor of the Times, wanted to stop the print run. And the, ed- the deputy editor, Brian MacArthur, he rang Rupert Murdoch and said what was happening. Yep. <laughs> and Murdoch uh, famously replied, fuck Dacre, publish. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> hurrah. Not. And I hope that that cost him millions of marks. I presume it did. Quite right, yeah. yeah. I presume it did. So it was published. They published that they were serialising. They published yeah, yeah, the yeah. yeah. They published a declaration that they had serialised it yeah. from Stern and to try and usurp Newsweek. And they're saying we've got serialised rights to these diaries. They have been authenticated. It's all going to be amazing and brilliant. And then the next day there was a press conference in Hamburg, um, at which point the historians basically said, "I don't think these are real." Right, okay. <laughs> Not with this Chinese plastic lettering on the front cover. <laughs> we haven't well, covered that yet. Have we? we haven't covered that yet. No, I was, I was, I was. I don't know why I was keeping that in the back pocket. I was, I just, I love it. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> All of the diaries had uh, Gothic script embossed lettering on the front of them. Mm-hmm. However, <laughs> true to his poor yeah, uh, planning, yeah, his, yeah, poor, his poor standard and spelling, and preparation. Yeah, they were from Hong Kong. They were plastic. Right. So it wasn't gold leaf embossed. No. They were plastic stick-on letters, basically. Sure. <laughs> because he wasn't really uh, that good at the Gothic script. Yep. He mistook the F, thinking it was an A. So the lettering on the diary actually was F-H, not A-H, like yeah. he thought it was. Fadolf Hitler. <laughs> Fadolf right, Hitler. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he repeated that for all of them. Excellent. Which is interesting, because when he took... <laughs> he, he put that F in Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it also, at the same time, he he took a, original SS notebook markers and authentic wax seals mm. and put those on, and yet yep. the the notebooks were cheap modern notebooks, yeah, sure. cheap modern inks, Dipped in tea and plastic <laughs> lettering that just like yeah. stuffed on. I mean, it, it, it's incredible that yeah. and nobody seemed to notice this yeah, at all. Yeah, sure, yeah, because they all wanted it, it to yeah, be exactly. true. Everyone wanted, wanted to it to be I true. I mean, that is more fascinating, I find, or more scary. That not <laughs> the fact that anything to do with the diary, it's just the fact that everyone involved wanted Murdoch wanted it to be true yeah. so he could make money out of it. The collectors and the other editors just wanted it to be true well, because they wanted to put it in their publication, but also because they were far right wingers. Yeah, and they Murdoch just were, is. yeah, and they were just well up for. Yeah. It being and there's certain the, momentum of investment as well, isn't there? It's like it come yeah, down a, a long yeah, yeah. way, and a lot of money's been spent. No one really it wants can't to say be fake now. <laughs> but but <laughs> he has spent, no clothes. <laughs> we've spent a fortune. It has to be true. Yeah, because we've spent a fortune. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we've come too far for this to be fake. <laughs> it's interesting that, as you mentioned earlier, David Irving, who is mm. not a, a character that I would normally want to identify with, but he he's or give any airtime to. Or give any airtime to. But in fairness, but. at this press conference, he uh, he was there and he stood up and he was asking questions is, uh, and is basically saying, you haven't tested the ink and how could Hitler have written so much about the plot of the 20th of July, the uh, Stauffenberg plot, when he was injured and couldn't write with right. his arm? You know, 
but you see, throwing historical detail in their face, saying this is not possible. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> got, and there was basically almost a, a fight broke out, and he was physically removed. And as they dragged <laughs> him out, he was shouting, ink, ink, ink. Back at <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Some maniacal octopus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, basically, that, that example is, it's a perfect example of he, it, it, however odious he is, he, he kind of, you know, he, 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 he I nearly said he well, he's knows. He's not a man known for sticking what, to facts. No, I, I nearly said he knows what he's talking about. But the, it doesn't matter what he's going to say. People are not yeah. going to side with him. So therefore, nobody did and be- yeah. continued to believe Perhaps their... Perhaps he was more credible. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he was never that credible because after no, they not, yeah, yeah. after they started to publish extracts, um, <laughs> he changed his mind. So they probably are real. <laughs> oh, right. While everyone else right. was changing their mind and saying they're probably fake. Right, OK. So essentially an emergency meeting was called and they decided, actually, you know what, we probably ought to test this stuff. <laughs> and that's when they realised that it wasn't, they were all fake um, because of and the... And they taste of tea. And they taste yeah. of tea. And yeah, it's as I say, all the all the things we've said pointing out how obviously false they were. They suddenly went, "Oh yeah, look, not real." Of course, they were fake. Cujo discovered that he had been named as the forger, and that Stern had paid nine million Deutschmarks, which he, of course he was furious about because he hadn't got that much yeah, money. Of course, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He hadn't got it at all. But he agreed to hand himself in. It says now May of 1983, he wrote out a full confession and he said that Heidemann knew they were fake all along. I don't know that that's true. I think Heidemann probably really. believed that they weren't, but he, Heidemann was obsessed. He just wanted it to be. And yeah. he wanted it to be. And he also he wanted all the money. But he was also arrested. Was he? Yeah. So there was another year of investigation and both of the men went on trial, charged with defrauding Stern of 9.3 million Deutschmarks uh, which is about four and a half million dollars at the time could have got something like four and a half years wasn't it uh, Heidemann four years eight months and four years six months for Cujo oh, right yeah well the trial lasted nearly a year in itself wow <laughs> um, one of the uh, magistrates uh, was replaced because he fell asleep during the trial <laughs> right, fine <laughs> And there were all sorts of... Basically, it was a slagging match between Heidemann and Kujau. Oh, uh, uh, really? They fully yeah, yeah, turned they on each other fell out of love. Yeah. So Kujau was found guilty of receiving £1.5 million for for the forgeries, and Heidemann was found guilty of stealing £1.7 million <laughs> just, just straight so off the top. They're doing Most nothing. of the money wasn't recovered, though, was it? There's £5 million that I mean, not that I would want to spend four years in prison for anything... But who got the nine what of that three. and where it went? Pessimistically, say three hundred grand a year. I don't know. Would you? <laughs> would you go to prison for three hundred grand a year? Um, well, depends I, what prison no. it is, isn't it? Um, other interesting things: uh, Heidemann's collection was put under scrutiny, um, and understandably, a, a lot of mirth in court when he had a framed set of Idi Amin's underpants. <laughs> 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 Very good. Oh, I mean, even if they were real, why has he got that <laughs> framed? <laughs> Again, just loved crazy people. Yeah, sure. Dictator yeah. chic. One of the fake diaries was sold in 2004 for 6,400 euros. Oh, God. It's just um, gained its own niche value. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. Famous for being famous. Yeah. But most of the diaries are in the German archives. The Stern magazine, what they bought, they handed over to the German Bundesarchive in 2013. And they're why all kept they? as a... As a why? They're just, mm, just gobbledygook. Burn, should just why, burn them. Why would you even keep them? Uh, there are, there are um, news media history, historical documents. Well, I suppose so. But, I mean, bloody hell, it's just a total hobgoblin. <laughs> <laughs> hobgoblin? <laughs> Kujau um, also published his own diary <laughs> of the time. Are you he was sure in, it wasn't it written was by Hitler? Secret diary, his true story inverted commas oh, okay. of the Hitler diaries. I mean, that's probably and they're not they're bad. They're published and bound as if they were the Hitler diaries. Right, okay, you know, all those yeah, black yeah. covers with the seal on them. Mm. Well, if he actually tells the truth about it, it's probably quite interesting. But quite possibly, yeah. But but is it? <laughs> 
And he yeah. sold uh, authenticated forgeries as well. <laughs> so they were signed <laughs> by the original artist and by him. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so that you could tell him. He appeared on German television and for the cr- uh, the crowd absolutely loved him and were cheering and mm. clapping him when he came on. Really? Yeah. And to entertain the crowd, he was forging members of the audience's signatures. Oh, <laughs> They'd come up, sign their name on a big whiteboard, and, and underneath he would sign their name do again. It perfectly. Yeah. There's, there's art forgers that get that kind of reception as well, isn't there? Because yeah. They've, they've done, been... They're just appreciating their skill, yeah. yeah as yeah. opposed to, hang on, you're and putting one over on the s- s- art snobs kind of right. Oh, uh, okay. Was it his daughter or his niece who, after his death, faked forgeries of his? Faked his fakes. Yeah, sold them as original <laughs> Cujo fakes. She was making them. Excellent. Because she got arrested. She got arrested and was uh, did some time for it. What for faking? For faking. His- yeah. But they're fa- faking his fakes. Yeah. Faking fakes. That so he absolutely, fakes. I reckon now, there are forgeries purporting to be her fakes of his <laughs> fakes. Uh, of probably. the fake yeah, Hitler yeah. diaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you get arrested for someone faking a fake? It's, well, it's perfectly legal to, to fake something. Perfectly legal. In fact, I did it quite recently myself for a, um, oh, a commission. A 50 pound note. I faked... <laughs> A Modigliani myself. You just but that's but perf- but you didn't perfectly fake acceptable. It. You just, no, had, no, a, it you just had a go at it, though. But pretending you? that it it's is by Modigliani makes it a forgery, and that yeah, becomes a crime. Yeah, yeah. But so making, you did a study. You're of just having a go at it. No, it's a it's a brush for brush copy. <laughs> but you were just trying to. I mean, you're not passing it off as in. No, exactly. You didn't that becomes a forgery. Name. Yeah. If you what's sign his name, Modigliani. What? What's his first name? Amadeo. So you. Colin, <laughs> Colin Modigliano. Um, the but you're just having a yeah. It's if seeing if you what it's like. Yeah, if you suggest that it is by the original, then well, then obviously comes. I mean, that's, that's a, <laughs> yeah. But it's perfectly acceptable to make something which is, by all essences, exactly the same as an original. Right. If he made his Hitler diaries and just said, "This is what I reckon they'd have been," yes. had he written them, yeah. No one would have said anything. No. It'd be oh, really? Right. Would they would have, been, have either said, oh, cheers. Would have just or, been interesting. Or yeah. this interesting, or stay away from him, he's a nutter. Yeah. But no one would have cared, <laughs> would they? It's just the yeah. fact that, oh, yeah, yeah. Here's another one. <laughs> Since yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, Rupert Murdoch was asked how he felt about the position that out the, the that Sunday Times yeah, would yeah. be in, given that... Uh, the, they were, they were fake, proved fake, and he said, um, "Well, we're in the business of entertainment." Right. He didn't care either. Way. He didn't care. No. He said, "We didn't lose money or anything like that because they gained twenty thousand new readers, and they All didn't then lose them." Yeah, right. Okay. So the circulation increased. Well, that sums that up basically, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And in fairness, the Sunday Times should have known better because they had form. Oh, uh, right. In 1968, they tried to buy the Mussolini diaries. <laughs> Right, okay. Which were fakes produced by a mother and daughter team (laughs) who produced 30 diaries, Mm -hmm. which apparently not only fooled an expert, but also the son of Mussolini, (laughs) who believed that they were real. Well, well. Um, But, uh, yeah, so the 30, these are also proved to be forgeries and the Sunday Times. (laughs) So the Sunday Times should have known better there. There has been some things on television and in film. Yep. There's a German movie called Stonk. <laughs> That's Stonk. a great type. Stonk. They should have an exclamation mark at the end. It does, yeah, where the people, like ex-bin men, but I'd love to see lids. the musical of Hitler Diaries. <laughs> You've seen Stonk? For Hitler. Yeah. Have you? Why did you see Twice. that? What a load of rubbish. I mean, seriously, you saw it twice. Oh, yeah. Do you remember there was a fag for Stomp? Yes. Yeah. Like, what an absolute load other of rubbish. Well. Literally. There was another one, you saw like what? Stomp. Um, <laughs> you saw a spin-off? Yeah. What were they bashing? <laughs> like, something else. Each other. Yeah, the, what an absolute load of rubbish that was. <laughs> it's just pointless. Was it all bin lids? No, no, sticks. <laughs> Great. Puddles. <laughs> Wellies puddles. and puddles. Oh, yeah. God, it, there's that, lots of water. Splashing. How how long did it? How long did the performance last? Like Ninety minutes. Oh my God, <laughs> that deserves two minutes. Front row. Gets, <laughs> did he get wet? Free, no, gets a free water 
waterproof. Oh, because you get yeah, wet. Because you get wet. And you went twice. <laughs> and you, did you nudge was the person it, and say, it, "There's a good bit coming"? <laughs> <laughs> was it different this oh, next time? Duck. <laughs> oh God. So, was sh- sh- stonk. Stonk. <laughs> stonk. Stonk. Sorry, I'm getting... It's 1992. It's basically a German film that tells the story of the Hitler diet of the hoax. Yep. The word stonk, it doesn't mean anything. Scam it, or something? No, it doesn't mean anything. It's taken from The Great Dictator because... <laughs> yeah, because it? Charlie Chaplin's dictator in The yeah. Great Dictator, he when he expresses disgust, he goes, stonk. Okay. Uh-huh. Like, as in, like, sort of damn or hell or something. Right. He says stonk. So they call the okay. movie stonk. It's quite, as good, in, you know, it's quite a good word. Thing. Yeah. It's also subtitled um, The Film Accompanying the Fuhrer's Book. That's right. Okay. <laughs> the film <laughs> from book from That's good, actually. That's good humour. So that's already funny. I haven't seen yeah. it. There's in there was a 1986 book by Robert Harris, you know, the yes. mm. novelist. Yeah. Called Selling Hitler, the, the story of the Hitler Diaries, and he's not, normally fiction. He normally he? does fiction. He does yep. things like um, one of, Fatherland was one of his that was made into a film with um, Rutger Hauer. Great movie. Mm-hmm. In 1991, this book, Selling Hitler, was made into a five-part series on ITV in Britain. Mm. Yep, it's a fantastic series, and it, it stars Jonathan Price as Heidemann. Oh and, right. Oh sorry. It's sorry. It's a uh, drama. I thought yeah. it was a documentary or something. No, it's a drama, but it's it's a docudrama. Who? Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price. Oh, right. okay. Jonathan and Price. Alexi Sale. Alexi Sale really? as um, really? Kuchel. Well, well. Tom Baker is in it. Is he? Alan yeah. Bennett's in it. Roger Lloyd Pack. Richard Wilson. Barry Humphreys is plays Rupert Murdoch. Well, that's good casting. I mean, it's a yeah. hell of a cast. That's good casting, man. Uh, it's phenomenal. Wow. Uh, Jonathan Price in it, yes. it very much kind of alludes back to his role in Brazil. Yep. Mm. with the yes, fantasy sequences yes, there's sort of grandiose theatrical yes. dream sequences and in Selling Hitler he also, Heidemann character goes into fantasies about the opera why didn't you give the score of Wieland the Blacksmith to Heidemann he would have paid you anything for it but I can't write a note of music Alexi's not at his best I'd have to say in this no, but he's, <laughs> able, he's very able yeah you know part. he is, Yeah, he's good value in it I think he's... what was Alan Bennett doing in it? Alan Bennett. <laughs> I think these diaries are fake. Uh, yes. He oh, played okay. Trevor Roper, yeah. Oh, he did? Oh, right, OK. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm, I'd be good at um, casting. Yeah, but Roger Lloyd Pack as David Irving is a bit weird. Um, Trigger. I've got <laughs> 27 diaries today. <laughs> it's 35 <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Care to do your best Richard Wilson? I don't <laughs> believe this is go. real. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's all for this time. If you want to know more about what we've talked about on this episode, then just Google it or something. You can listen to all of our previous episodes on our website. That's www.truecrimediary.co.uk. Please remember to leave a review on your podcast provider if you can, or you can email us. That's stuff at truecrimediary.co.uk. My thanks to Jed and Rue and to all of you for listening and we'll see you again on next date in our true crime diary.